Welcome to worship this morning at Wesley. My name is Pastor Sylvia Harris, and as always, it's a joy to look out and see all of your faces in worship. As a reminder, prayer cards are in your bulletins. If there are things that we can be in prayer for you, that I can be in prayer for you, please take the time to write that down. They can go in the offering plates at the end of the worship service. The offering plates are, of course, located in the front and the back of the sanctuary. We don't pass them because of COVID. Um, other announcements, you can look on the back of your bulletin, and there's a listing there for you of all of the upcoming events and such going on here at Wesley. As a reminder, today and next Sunday, we're going to be having a time of fellowship to talk about the story of Wesley, the history of Wesley. Who are we? What are our strengths? What are our values? Um, what are the stories that we can tell about this church? Um, and so please, I invite all to come and participate and be a part of that time. I promise you'll get out in plenty of time today to go watch that big event that they say is taking place in Southern California. I don't really know much about that. I've been out watching commercials and a halftime show myself, but we'll get out for it, I promise. Um, to make you aware as well, we have partnered, I told you last week, but just as a reminder, we, we have a partnership with Embry Health. They're gonna be setting up drive-through COVID testing in our parking lot for six months. It's gonna run Monday through uh, Saturday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. for six months. It's scheduled to start this week, um, so if you see that, be aware. I did tell you ahead of time, um, but that is going to be happening. In addition, rem reminder that at the end of the month, we're having our potluck take home. Bring us something to share and take the meal home. Um, it's the end of the month, the last Sunday, as part of our celebration of Black history. And also, looking forward to Wednesday, March the 2nd, is Ash Wednesday. There's not going to be a service, but I will be here for two hours in the middle of the day for those who want to come and perhaps spend some time in prayer in the sanctuary or just to receive the imposition of ashes as we enter into the Lent season. So all of that is there. You can take the bulletin home with you and mark up your calendar after you stay for that time today to talk about the history of Wesley, right? Not darting out the door right away. Uh, so those are those announcements, and then I just want to also invite you to celebrate that it has been one year since we reopened the doors of Wesley. Um, we opened the doors last year on Valentine's Day um, as our first in-person service following closing for, oh, how long were we closed for? Almost a full year that the doors of Wesley were not open um, because of the ongoing pandemic. And so I just think that's a wonderful celebration for us to remember that today it has been one full year of in-person worship, and what a beautiful thing that is. Those are my announcements. Miss Lucy, do you want to come up and read for us this morning in honor of Black History? to celebrate black history and the African-American role in the development of this country, I want to take a moment to focus in on the most integral component of that movement, the black church. It is impossible to talk about black history without talking about the part that the black church has played in it. Unknown and unappreciated by many is a role that the organized members of the household of faith played in changing the social landscape of America. The black church arises as a byproduct of the reality of racism in America. Prevented from worship with our white counterparts, we worship God with one another. And from there, the black church has always been significant in the 25th chapter of the book of Genesis, we find a very familiar tale. The story of two brothers, Esau and Jacob. The Bible tells us that Esau 
returning home, famished from laboring in the fields, begged Jacob to give him some of the stew that he had just prepared. Jacob, jealous of the favor and royalty that Esau had been born into, offered to give Esau a bowl of stew in exchange for his birthright. Esau foolishly agrees to his brother's proposal and barters his birthright for something uneven in worth, even deeper. Esau values his personal position more than the legacy he is not only born into, the privilege to be a part of. The historical context of the washout services that are currently held around the country on New Year's Eve is found in the beginnings of the Black Church. In the 1800s, slaves and freemen were gathered in churches on New Year's Eve, praying together while awaiting the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. The Montgomery Improvement Association that later started the Montgomery Bus Boycott back in 1955 was not the brainchild of an elected official, official or government agency, but rather the product of community churches coming together and organizing strategic ways to mobilize people and speak out against racial injustice in the Jim Crow South. In the 50s and 60s, the black church was not only a place for praise and worship, but also a bulletin board for the African-American community, a center of political activism. Not only Martin Luther King Jr., but Ralph Abernathy, C.T. Vivian, Fred Shuttlesworth, Bernard Lee, Otis Moss Jr., and Young, Joseph Lowry, Gardner C. Taylor, and a host of others find the beginnings of their natural influence in the black churches they preached in on Sunday morning. The black churches always represented the spiritual and moral foundation for the United States, allowing the love of God that overflowed in their churches to spill over in our communities. So as we celebrate another Black History Month, crediting those brightest among our people, we must be certain to give credit to that which has always been the backbone of our community and the <clears throat> conscience of our country, the Black Church. The Black Church is literally founded, fighting for freedom, seeking to establish our spiritual and social identity and in times such as these, where many work to make a minimum wage lower than the living wage in our country, where brothers and sisters are still violently victimized because of the color of their skin, where many in power are more concerned with economics than ethics, if we choose not to re-embrace the history that the church is steeped in and cease to fight for freedom, then we have sadly sold our birthright, just as Esau did to Jacob centuries ago. It is impossible to talk about black history without talking about the black church. And this month, we ought to take time to celebrate her and all God has done for our people through her. But as we celebrate her, we must also see this time as a Call to arms, arms, a reminder of whom we are accountable to. We are accountable to the God we serve and of all of his children who were charged to introduce Christ to knowing what legacy was left to us this month. We must also ask ourselves, what is the, is the legacy we will leave behind? The United Church, the West of the United Methodist Church, the black, black History, and the Black Church. Thank you very much.
Good morning, Lancer. Good morning. Good morning. Please join with me in our call to worship. Remember the good news that we have received and proclaimed this day. The good news in which we stand and through which we are being saved. We will remember and hold tightly to the truth we proclaim with joy. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said that he would. But the story doesn't end in death. Christ is raised on the third day, just as it was promised. We are witnesses to this good news, and God commands that we do not keep this news to ourselves. We will testify to all that Christ is Lord. Our opening song is To God Be the Glory, Glory found on page 98 in the count. Verses 1 through 3. Please stand and give your hand. Deuteronomy 
in chapter 10 that is found on page 167 in the Pew Bible. So now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? Only to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all of his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his decrees that I am commanding you today for your own well-being. Although heaven and the heaven of heavens belong to the Lord your God, the earth with all that is in it, yet the Lord set his heart in love on your ancestors alone and chose you, their descendants, after them, out of all the peoples as it is today. Circumcise, then, the foreskin of your heart and do not be stubborn any longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, almighty and awesome, who is not partial and takes no bribe, who, is, who executes justice for the orphan and the widow, and who loves the strangers, providing them food and clothing. You shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God. Him alone you shall worship. To him you shall hold fast, and by his name you shall swear. He is your praise. He is your God who has done for you these great and awesome things that your own eyes have seen. Your ancestors went down to Egypt, 70 persons, and now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars in heaven. First Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7, found on page, this is from the New Testament, found on page 175. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. May the Lord add a blessing. Would you please pray with me? Lord, we come before you this day asking that the words of my mouth and the meditations of the hearts and minds of all those hearing my voice be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this morning, we're continuing with our examination of love from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Last week, we took a look at those first three verses, and I talked about how whatever we do is nothing if we do it without love. The greatest gifts and talents, the greatest intellect and insights and understandings, the greatest forms of self-sacrifice, they are all bankrupt without love. Whatever we do, whatever we say, whatever we believe becomes worthless 
if we're doing, saying, believing without love. Now, remember, Paul wrote this letter to the church in Corinth because of all of their divisions and infighting and the problems that they were having. I've said this before about scripture. We can never just take the text and look at it as if it holds a singular understanding without looking at the fullness of the text around it. We need to understand what is being said as it was written within the whole letter to 1 Corinthians here, right? So we cannot say this chapter is about love and ignore the rest of the context of the letter. We understand this chapter about love because of the whole context of the letter. And so I want to remind us today that the words that we heard about what love is and what love is not, I want to remind us that these words were written to a church, to a community in relationship with people that they knew, right? They were in relationship with people that they knew, and yet they were in a division. They were in strife and infighting with people who were known to each other. This letter was not written to a church because they were failing to love strangers. This letter is not written because the church was building a wall to keep people out. This church, these words, these imperatives of what love is and what love is not, the outline that Paul wrote here is something that was directed to a church, to a community who was behaving badly towards themselves, towards each other, towards people in their very own faith community. Do you hear what I'm saying? This is not a hypothetical correction about failing to welcome the stranger, the sojourner into the fellowship of the community. This is a very concrete reality of a church that was dividing itself up, determining for itself who was in and who was out based on their own opinions and views and interpretations. If we look back at the very beginning of the letter, the very beginning of 1 Corinthians, Paul writes after his initial greeting in the name of Christ. He writes in chapter 1, verse 10. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no division among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same purpose. There be no division among you. The word division here, my friends, is schisma or schizo, meaning to split or tear. What Paul is asking for here is that the church does not schism, that they do not divide themselves. Instead, he wanted them to remain united in their emotional seat. The word we translate as mind actually has this emotional connotation to it in the original Greek. So Paul wanted them to remain united emotionally and to remain in the same purpose, having the same knowing, the same discernment. Paul writes this letter, but we have now divided into 16 chapters and I didn't take the time to count how many verses. He writes this letter because he wanted the church in Corinth to remain united, to keep them from a schism. Now, it goes without saying that over the millennia, the church itself, the church universal, has had multiple schisms. And the truth is that we, as the United Methodist Church, are facing a schism within our own denomination. And that is something that we will, as the church called Wesley here in Phoenix, we will have to take that issue up and we will have to decide what that looks like for us. But as we examine the reading from the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, I want us to remember that Paul wrote these words as a way of encouraging the church in the first century to not look toward how we can, in our humanness, how we can divide Christ, 
how our humanness wants us to believe that some have greater knowledge and access and understanding while others have less. Paul wrote to the church to remind them that they all needed each other. Remember the imagery that he uses in chapter 12 is the imagery of the body of Christ. And he reminds them of their need to clothe those that seem the least respectable with the most respect. Paul wrote to the church to encourage them to remain united. Never telling them that unity requires uniformity. I say all of this to you because as we consider what Paul tells the church in Corinth, and by default then of course tells us in this church in Phoenix today, what Paul says about the nature of love, this is an instruction that he is giving them, not because of how they were treating people they did not know. This is an instruction that he is giving them because of how they are failing to love their own family. To love their own brothers and sisters in Christ. How they were failing to love the ones they could see. They acted as if they could refuse to love the ones that they could see in the flesh and yet claim to have love for the one who has risen and can no longer be seen with the naked eye. Love is patient. Put another way, love is long-suffering. Long-suffering. Are you patient with the ones you know? with the ones that you see in front of you. Who is missing from these pews, my friends, from this family of Christ? Because we have chosen short-tempered over patience. It's easy to be patient with a stranger. We don't have a history with them, right? The stranger who asks for directions or who needs a few dollars. The stranger who is, well, maybe kind of annoying a little bit, but they're a stranger. And so we know we don't have to deal with them ongoing. We can be patient for that person because we know they're not going to be with us for very long. But what about our brother or sister? Can we be patient? Long-suffering with the sibling who is annoying or needy or draining of our time and energy. Love is patient. Can we maintain patience with the people we know? <clears throat> Imagine for a moment the patience of our God with what you choose to do in your day-to-day -day life week after week, month after month, year after year. Agape, the love of God in Christ, is patient. Love is kind. Are you kind with the ones you know, the ones you see in front of you? Who is missing from these pews, my friends? from this family of Christ because we have failed to choose kindness over cruelty. It is easier to be kind to a stranger, to have the kindness to answer seemingly never-ending questions, to have an understanding that maybe they're suffering from a mental illness or an addiction. It's easier to be kind to that stranger than it is towards the family member towards the friend, towards the one we know. We lose kindness after a while, don't we? When they seem just a bit too needy, a bit too demanding, a little bit too much to keep being around. 
We lose kindness after a while, turning instead towards perhaps cruelty or even indifference or apathy as our default when the one we know becomes more than what we want to continue with in kindness. When they're draining our emotions, our time, our energy, perhaps even our wallet, it becomes too much to maintain kindness. Yet our God, the one we claim to follow in Christ, the agape love of, of our Creator, is kind, patiently kind. Love is not envious or boastful or rude. Do you envy the one you know? The one you know who has a certain house or car or even a certain family dynamic that you look at and you think, oh man, if I could just have that. I kind of wish I had that, huh? Do you envy the one you know? Wishing perhaps that you had that job, that intellect, or even perhaps wishing that you had that ignorance, that you had that simple way of living life that seems to allow that other person, that one you know, to obliviously walk through the pains and challenges of whatever else that gets you down. Are you envious of how somebody else handles hardships? How somebody else handles the day-to-day -day life? Who is missing from these pews, from this family of Christ, because we're envious of the one we know? Are you boastful or arrogant? Do you look at that one you know, that sibling that you know, and think, thank you, Lord, I'm not like them? Except even as you're saying, thank you, God, I'm not like them, even as you're saying it, you're really taking credit for your own good fortune, your own talents and gifts and the ways that you have been uniquely created. You're arrogantly assuming, thank God I'm not like them, for what God has made you to be in the first place. Who is missing from these pews? from this family of the Almighty because we have chosen arrogance in our lives. We talked a little bit last week about boastfulness. And so I ask you as well, who is missing from these pews because we choose to boast instead of love? You know, when I looked up the word rude and I looked up synonyms for the word rude, the very first word that was there was abusive. Abusive. Love is not abusive, my friends. Now, abuse can take the form of physical abuse. We heard a beautiful testimony several weeks ago from Mrs. Zetta about physical abuse, and I hope that we can understand how that is not love. But abuse is more than physical, right? Abuse is cruel words. Abuse is harmful discourse. Abuse, it is snubbing and insulting and vulgar. So I ask you, who is missing from these pews, my friends? From this family of Christ? Because we have given in to rudeness. Love. Agape, the love of God in Christ is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. Now I must confess, I insist on my own way Testify. I'm right 
right though, right? Like I'm right. When I insist on my own way, it is because I know what's best. I know I have thought it all out. Stop laughing. I have considered everything that needs to be considered. And we're going to do it my way. <laughs> but if I'm listening to Paul, if I'm listening to the challenges that were facing the church in the first century, the challenges that are apparently faced by me and my marriage in the 21st century, if I'm listening to Paul, I need to let go of this insistence on my own. Who is not sitting here with us, my friends, because we have insisted on our own way, refusing to hear other options or consider other courses of action to hear other concerns? Who have we failed to love because we have insisted on our own way? Love is not irritable or resentful. You know, one of the synonyms that I found for irritable is petulant. Petulant. Childishly sulking. Love is not a petulant, childishly sulking way of being. Love is not resentful unsympathetic. Put another way, love is not a petulant, unsympathetic child. Let's be honest. It's really hard sometimes not to act like a petulant, unsympathetic child with those who know us best. We don't go around, usually as adults in society anyway, we don't go around sulking like petulant, unsympathetic children in public with strangers, right? We're more likely to act that way with the people we know. We talk about needing to love strangers, needing to love our neighbors that we don't know. And yet the more we read, the more we examine and explore what Paul writes about love, the more evident it becomes that the ways we fail to love is not with the people we don't know. It's with the people we know best. We claim to follow and love and do the will of the one we cannot see. And yet we fail to love and respect and honor the ones we do see the ones we see most closely. How crazy is that? As I've been thinking this over this last week, I was struck by how often it is that with our children, that we are so glad when they behave in public and for their teachers and with those adults that we have entrusted them with, and yet they act up at home, right? If you're a parent or if you've had a hand in raising children, perhaps you can relate to that. We tell ourselves that we are glad that they don't embarrass us in public or with their teachers or with whoever we've entrusted them with to watch them, but it is really hard sometimes to have them treat us with petulant and unsympathetic behaviors at home. Then I was reflecting even more and I, and I realized that my husband has said to me many times over, I think he's more serious about this than I care to admit, but he has said to me jokingly, how am I the lucky one who gets to see all this? <laughs> Fill in the blank, my friends, on what all this is in my behaviors, okay? When I'm upset or stressed out or whatever kind of mood has hit and I am acting like a sulking, petulant, unsympathetic child towards him. I'm not acting out of love. The true love of what God has shown us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, maybe I'm confessing to behaviors here that y'all can't relate to, but I'm hoping the laughter puts me in good grace still, okay? In my 
journey. I'm still maturing when it comes to love. I think in all our journeys, we're still maturing when it comes to love. And I think for most of us, the challenge is not in loving our neighbor, in loving the stranger or the sojourner. It's in loving the ones we know the best. Maybe that's our literal siblings in this world. Maybe that's our parents, our children, in my case, my spouse. Maybe that's the person we know we used to see in church. Maybe that's the person we used to sit with in church. But we had a falling out with for whatever reason. Maybe that's the person that we work with and we just can't stand the sight of anymore because they're so annoying and entitled and just, ah! It's hard to love the ones we know. To love the ones we've seen and who have seen us. Because the ugly, the challenging, the annoying, the less than easy personalities that we encounter in life, they require long suffering, patience, and kindness. Until we can love the ones that we see, the ones that we know in this world, how can we ever claim to love the one we don't see? How can we recognize and live into the space where we act as if the love of God in Christ Jesus truly bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, if we can't extend it to the ones we know the best? The good news, my friends, is that even though we have likely all failed in some ways to live into this kind of love, this kind of true agape, the love of God in Christ, the good news, my friends, is that we know better today. And so we do better today. Love is not going to rejoice or throw it in our face of how we've made mistakes in the past, right? Because the scripture tells us that love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. And so love is not going to beat us over the head with how we may not have measured up. And that is good news because then we can recognize that every time we choose to love in truth, every time we choose patience, kindness, supportiveness, pleasantries, even with those we know the best, even with those we have likely failed to love in the past, when we choose to act according to love, we choose a way that will rejoice because we're being changed a bit more into who we're called to be. And I don't know about you, but in a world that seems bent on doing so much without love, I'll take a fraction of change in my heart towards true love any day. And now I would invite you, I forgot to tell you at the beginning, we're resuming a little time of witnessing and worship today. So I would invite you as the spirit moves, because I know there's somebody here that the spirit is saying, you got a word to say in response. And so I'd invite you to stand where you are and share that word with us now. Well, I just want to thank my, this is, stand up. <laughs> this is my goddaughter. Yeah. And she's here celebrating me, my 6101 birthday. That's right. Yes. Happy birthday, Mrs. Friday. <laughs>
Well, first of all, I enjoyed the sermon. Yeah. And I think we all need to focus on a little bit more love uh, for the folks around us, particularly. And it's been a pleasure to come to Phoenix uh, from California. I'm from Oakland. And we came for her birthday, yes, uh, February 9th. And we had a lovely dinner. And then all of her friends, some of you are here, have sent her many gifts. Yeah. And that's really, really good for me to see. Yeah. So yeah. thank you, Wesley. OK. Thank you. Yeah. talking about faith when she I was reading that when you think about faith I just thought about when I was a little girl I shared my room with uh, my sister and one night I asked her I said well what did you pray about and she said well I, I asked to go to Baltimore and get a bike and I said well you better pray about something you can really get <laughs> well that summer, she went to Baltimore, she got a bike, she got more clothes, and to top it all off, she grew an inch or so taller than me. And I guess that was God telling me, you know, you think too small. <laughs> but uh, it's, I always remember that, and I want to say, go for the goal, because God <coughs> can provide the goal. Yes. Amen. 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 Oh, that's a beautiful testimony. Thank you. Next week. Oh, yes, go right ahead. Hi. <laughs> it was funny when I looked at the scriptures when I was reading it, but uh, that's the same scripture. My family reunion, we have family reunions, oh gosh, since I was five or six years old. But my one of my cousins picked that scripture for our family. Over 40 years ago, for us to uh, encompass as a family, because my father used a lot of those words for us to live by. Mm -hmm. And today, all of us in our family, we always go by that scripture. We sign our letters, love endures. And if you get anything from us, that's what you will get is love endures. So when I heard that scripture, you will always know that's from some of us. It was 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and those verses that you're going to get from my family. And over 40 years ago, we have been using that scripture for our family to live by. And uh, it just brought that memory to our childhood. Amen. 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 That's beautiful. Thank you, Ms. Vera. Witnessing is coming around again next week. So if you didn't get it today, trust me, you'll get it next time. <laughs> if you would turn in your bulletin now, in your bulletin is uh, hymn 2021, What a Mighty God We Serve. You can sing as a response, please.
We come before you this day confessing that we have failed to love. We have failed to love our siblings, our family, our friends, our fellow believers. We have failed to love those closest to us with the same love that you have shown. Forgive us, we pray, even as you help us to forgive ourselves. We have fallen short, yet even as we fall short, Lord, we praise the ways that we have known you, the ways that you have continued to know us, continue to love and care for us, continue to guide us into being more perfect in this world. We praise the magnitude of your mercy, of your glory, of your unending grace for all this world, setting for us an example of what it means to be truly inclusive, truly loving, truly living into the sign out front of our church that declares all are welcome. Lord, we confess that we have not welcomed all, falling short sometimes on even welcoming those we know. And yet your example remains, your truth continues, your love sustains and grows even when we have fallen short. So while we seek your forgiveness, we also are shouting out our praises for the unending example that you have given for the long-suffering patience of your love for us remains a truth that we can rest upon, a truth that we have been blessed and that we have assurances that we are yet part of this body of Christ in this world. Lord, there are those we know who are not with us in worship this day, those we know who are hurting and struggling. So we lift them up to you now, asking for your healing mercies and your comforting assurances. There are those we know, people listed by name in our bulletin, siblings that we bring before you today, trusting that you know each of their circumstances, each of their needs, and so we ask and claim your providence and grace and healing in their lives, each according to what they need. Lord, we have been watching the news and we see the divisions, the divisions of another political election cycle words used in campaigns to divide and destroy. Let your mercies and love pour out into the hearts and minds of the candidates and into the hearts and the minds of voters that we may seek to act for justice and equity, living according to love rather than fear. Lord, if we've been watching the news, we see the divisions that are happening on the other side of the world as tensions grow and militaries gather. And so we pray now for your wisdom and guidance for all the leaders that are involved, that they may seek ways to live in harmony rather than domination. Lord, if we've been watching the news, then we have seen the destruction that happened in our own backyard, another act of senseless violence and a child left orphaned. We pray that people may seek help when it is needed, that they may seek support and healing rather than believing that violence and harm are their only answers. Lord, we pray for the child left behind, for the loved ones left grieving, and for all those who have been harmed in this violent act. Source of love. Almighty God, there are prayers in the hearts and minds of those hearing my voice, and right now we claim answers and guidance and healing and hope, each according to the needs of those individual prayers, as we pray together now the prayer that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy name is kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I would invite you to stand as you are able and to join as you are comfortable in our closing hymn. Lift every voice and sing, number 519. <laughs>
Amen. Amen. 